Okay, this is the uh, scalability background uh, processing improvements demo. Um, I'm going to start. I have been working on um, this Q selector syntax, which actually Andrew wrote. I've just been sort of tidying it up. So I'm just going to share a terminal because I think that's all I need. Um, so basically, the idea is that at the moment you can do um, oops, uh, psychic cluster and you can do things like um, let's run merge. Um, and let's run merge. So that will create two processes, um, each of which are running just the merge worker. Um, but the problem with this is, like, from an operational perspective, when you're configuring it, um, you need to know what the queues are called. And we have a lot of queue names. Like, we have too many queue names. Um, like, so um, what we really want to do is be able to select queues by their attributes, um, which is what this new syntax does. So um, at the moment, it's just on this branch that I'm on. Um, also, for um, confirmation, like none of psychic cluster, the reason like it responds relatively quickly there is because it doesn't need any of the GitLab services to actually run in order to spin up its what its child processes. The child processes need that, but um, I'm using dry run here. So if we have this uh, queue query syntax option, which is, uh, I haven't come up with a better one and it's quite hard to type, but we, you won't have to type it very often because you'll configure it in gitlab.rb and then forget about it. Um, so you have this um, syntax. So we could say like, let's take all um, latent, uh, latency sensitive workers. Um, and these are they. Um, you can, so the, the basic syntax is, um, this is a term. Like, so we have, you know, we're querying on this field, latency sensitive. At the moment, you can query on that, whether it has external dependencies, um, its resource boundary, and its feature category. So we could say, um, oops, it should just have one. Uh, yep. So, you know, Git LFS just has one. Um, so that's sort of the basic building block um, obviously this can be um, not equal as well which will be like everything yep the other um, thing that's kind of weird but worth pointing out i don't know if you're just about to say this sean about the, the fact that it's actually a set and not a it's like an in not a equals. yeah so yes yeah. so um this means anything that's in the set represented by git lfs and source code management so any any yeah. worker that's in either of those feature categories um, then to and two terms together, you have, oops, you have, uh, let me just do this. Um, so let's say source code management and latency sensitive is a comma. Yeah. So um, I, I'll just give you a quick background as you say that on, on why I use comma. And now that we've done it, I think it's a bad idea. The reason I chose comma was because I wanted the old syntax that we used of just Q name, comma, Q name, comma, Q name to kind of work in the new world. But actually, if we're going to put it under a different um, flag, we don't need that. And so it would probably be much more worthwhile to have something that is like apparent and obvious to people using it. Yeah, I actually don't find this too bad because like, I see these as like, you know, you would write a comma Tins. separated list with and mm. at the end, right? Like, you know, if you're yeah. using a zero comma. So, I mean, like, I think, I think we could change it. I just, maybe, yeah. I don't know. I just that, look at the, this much the, the, the original, it and the, it actually the, worked fine for me. <laughs> yeah. The, <laughs> the original thing to make sure I, I, I understood correctly. Right now, if you add it like you did there, category source code management and latency sense, uh, comma latency sensitive two will run Source code management jobs plus. Yeah, are late. That's no, wrong. Okay, so if, if you want no, you source code management all. jobs or latency sensitive, that's a space. Um, and again, this kind of makes sense, but I don't know if that's just because I've been working on it, because you're sort of describing sets, right? So like the first set, the, the first query yeah. there, the first um, query is like, you know, something comma something something comma something and then the next one is followed by a space now 
I think at the moment I've documented it as experimental. So like, you know, we can change it. Mm -hmm. I, I, I wouldn't want to spend too much time tweaking the syntax, but also it's not too hard. Um, no, now that you've explained it, it makes sense. Yeah, I, one thing I worth noting it. is that there is no, the precedence is just fixed. So for instance, yeah. um, what's a good example? So if I do- uh, I can't use brackets. Yeah, exactly. So if I do this, um, uh, get LFS, yeah. Yeah, right. So if I do that, that's the same as um, this, yeah. but the set concatenation operator, the pipe, has the lowest precedence and the space or operator has the highest precedence. So it's handy to have them at both levels of that. And also because like, you know, you can only use the pipe for sets in a particular field. Um, also this works as you'd expect because you can set multiple Q groups with um, this. So if we did say, um, let's just change that to LFS to just get one. And let's say this is source code management and um, memory bound. Um, then I'll get two processes, um, one of which is running project export, which is the only source code management um, memory bound queue. And then the other one is the only queue that's in the um, LFS uh, objects. So when we configure this on our production environment, these won't be different because like, you know, that's not how we configure things. Like, you know, we have nodes dedicated to these things, but it is possible you might want to do that if you've got um, a more constrained environment. And the main benefit of this is that it gives the infrastructure team a lot more flexibility. So we already know that like our pull mirror jobs are the ones that run, um, what is it like, um, external dependency source code management jobs probably. Um, but we can't express that. We have to like, every time, if we add a job that does that, we have to go and update it. So, um, you know, here we can just um, see if I'm right. <laughs> it's probably not right. It's probably, oh no, well, I got repository update mirror at least. Um, but that lets us like be a bit more. The other ones don't have external dependencies. <laughs> well, yeah, this is the other thing. This, this will really quickly um, identify any areas where we've got the metadata wrong, but it's, yeah. it's obviously very easy to fix. And also now that it's just in, um, uh, where is it? Uh, now that it's all in this YAML file, it's kind of easy to just like spin through and look for a worker that you want anyway. Um, awesome. So, yeah, so basically this is, Andrew wrote this a while ago. I've just been tidying this up. Um, the documentation's already in the MR, um, nice. which Oswaldo is assigned to you, so you can tell me if the docs are good enough or not. Um, and um, yeah, hopefully once we, once we roll this out, we can sort of start trying these things. Um, obviously, because it's much more flexible, you can do a lot of things that are nonsense. So you could do like, um, you know, uh, which is yeah. obviously, a, you know, like, you know, that's just going to get you everything. Um, so and, Sean, uh, this, this file is being generated right now. Which, which file is this one? Uh, all qs.yaml. Um, oh, all right. This, this yeah. one's being generated, so, right? Yes. Yeah, can, so, can I ask a quick question about that YAML file? Mm -hmm. it's, it's got quite a strange looking syntax with the colon at the front. Is that so uh, that's a symbol? That's yeah, because it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's dubbed from Ruby. Right. Okay. Okay. So, okay so, so, so there's two things going on here. So first of all, this is the way that Ruby writes an array of hashes. Oh, you, sim symbol, like a new, the hashes key is a symbol in, in Ruby. Yes. So in this case, the hashes key is a symbol and here the value is also a symbol. So um, yeah. I did consider stringifying that everywhere, um, yeah. but it, it just seemed more fiddly and like the syntax is pretty compact anyway. It does look a bit weird, um, but it's And fine. it's generated, like we don't expect yeah. <laughs> people to be in editing this and making mistakes. No, so, but it is, yeah. it, it, it's okay to read, like, you know, because like yeah. I said, I've, I've been sort of looking through this when I've been writing specs because, um, what I need to do is I need to make sure that I pick workers from this file, not from the E version, because if I pick a file from the E version, then the spec will fail on the FOSS repository. Uh, right. So I've been do looking we, through it. Do we have like, um, is it validated when people add um, 
I don't remember this, I should know this, but is it validated in CI if people are a worker that this file gets updated? Yeah, so if you run this, it'll check, it'll, it basically just generates the file. It's like the um, task you added for the pop files, right? It just regenerates it and checks if it's the same after regeneration. If it's not, the build fails. Um, so it's, it's exactly the same as that. Um, so yeah, it's not actually done yet. Uh, it's not been reviewed yet, but um, yeah. Um, that's it. If you've got a suggestion, for, I, I don't want to bike shed too much, but if you do have suggestions for like, you know, better um, characters for the operators or a better name for the um, command line argument, now is probably the best time to do it because now is the easiest time for me to rename a bunch of stuff. <laughs> I'm thinking um, like queue select, queue selector maybe as the as the attribute or something like that. Yeah. Select queues. Maybe, yeah. The, the, the biggest issue I've had is that Q query is a lot of QU, et cetera, yeah. type. It yeah, it's go it's, from it's like, horrible. Wait, where am I? Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, just comment on the MR if you've, um, yeah. if you've got a suggestion. But uh, yeah, that's it. Any other questions there? I think that it would be really important to run it past, um, I, I know Craig on the original Craig Miskell on the original uh, MR or on the on the original proposal he kind of said yeah it's kind of surprising but it's I can understand it once I understand it but I, um, John I don't know if you have any sort of because because obviously what we want is for like SRE operator type folks to be able to grok this because they're the ones who ideally should be setting you know these these selectors um so it'd be definitely good to get like the go ahead from either craig or scarbeck or john or someone like that i think yeah i wonder if we should actually just pick um a random sre <laughs> like you yeah. know because um well scarbeck and Jav like are obviously very handy because they're on the delivery team but also they're on yeah. the delivery team um so yeah. like you know maybe they have a slightly yeah, different they're in these calls they see us yeah. building this stuff <laughs> yeah. It. yeah 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 yeah, they, 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 already, they already love us, um, basically. So, yeah. <laughs> but uh, I mean, Craig Miskell had some opinions in the, on the original proposal, so he might be a good person to, to pick. Yeah, up. I found this like when I started working on it, like, you know, I hadn't, I'd sort of read the issue, but hadn't really like thought about it very much. And like, honestly, it didn't take me very long before it was pretty obvious to me, okay, well, that means that. Like, I think because it's yeah. so minimal, like, you know, there's like. Yeah four five pieces of syntax <laughs> you know it doesn't it doesn't, and, and, it doesn't. <laughs> and, and the last thing we want to do is build like a full expression evaluator into sidekick cluster right like that no, was the other I, thing I, I, I want, just yeah. like over engineering it with brackets and like well i i, I think you know. i think that's what camel was worried about in the original issue as well when he said this is going to be quite complicated to build and that's why yeah. i think it's i've called it out in the docs as well about the precedence because yeah. that's the most important yeah. thing to me is that the precedence is absolutely fixed and you cannot yeah um, uh, change it and yeah. if you want something that's not there we should we should probably make the attributes richer rather than change the language um yeah is what i think yeah, okay. uh, for instance one thing yeah. that you can't query on right now which i think you probably should be able to and i've asked you about it in the mr andrew is name um because you might want to pick or exclude so, yeah. an, an explicit so, so the, name so no the what what we absolutely have to be able to do as well is something has gone haywire and it's spinning out and it's stealing all the CPU and we need to basically stop listening to that queue. And yeah. I think the best way to do that is a is a name. So so yeah, I'll um I'll comment on that in one. Cool, thanks. Um obviously it's pretty yeah. easy to add. Oh, the other thing I should have mentioned is um because of the way this is implemented, this works just fine with the negate option as well. Um so like, yeah. you know, you can you don't have to like try and figure out like how do I negate all my selectors and like that's not even possible because you can't do like nor um, and stuff, uh, but you can just negate the lot. Um, yeah. So yeah. You just need to remember your Boolean logic a little bit. Yeah, exactly. But you don't need, you don't need to like invert every operator on there, which you can't yeah. because it's not not the operators available. Um, but yeah. you can you can negate. So um, yeah. That works for like uh what we call best effort right which just just like yeah. everything else is going in here and we will get to it when we get to it um just to have kind of an idea what will our um separate queries look like we're going to have one uh, uh, if you go to the issue that's linked from the mr 
that should show you some examples that Andrew already wrote that match our current, yeah, that select like, to match our current node configuration. Yeah, and and I would imagine in the beginning it'll be like a one to one, and then we will probably say, okay, so we've got real, and th the biggest problem is like real time best efforts and all of those have got like horrible names. Like what is real time versus ASAP? Nobody knows, right? And so instead of trying to reform those, we'll create one called like latency sensitive CPU. I mean, that's also a horrible name, but like maybe something like that, that's a little bit more obvious. And then we'll, you know, basically launch that and it will kind of compete with real time and ASAP to kind of pick jobs out of that queue and then we'll kind of ramp it up and we'll shut those ones down. Um, is how I imagine we'll do that. And is the, the idea as well to be able to use different kinds of yeah, nodes or pods in the future? Yeah, for absolutely. Different workloads? So, the, so for the, you know, we already use different ones for the export jobs that have got lots and lots of memory. Um, and you know, with the um, the ones that use and create lots of disks, you know, use lots of disks like we've been discussing. Those ones would obviously go on a pod that's got like a big tempfs. I mean, I think the default for tempfs is like 80 gigs all round. So I kind of imagine that'll be fine almost anywhere. But yeah, I think you know, I think if they were just isolated, that might just be fine. Like, and if we reduce yeah. the concurrency, I think Bob mentioned somewhere like that's that's probably mm -hmm. the main issue, right? Like, you don't want yeah, multiple like jobs that are using yeah. lots of disk at the same time. Yeah. Um, yeah, and perhaps something to clean up after cleanup failed, stuff like that. The, the so I still feel like like we shouldn't be like we shouldn't be where we are. We shouldn't be cleaning up after the application. Like, um, like what I would rather do in that case because that's reboot like hey Kubernetes. Reboot it, like, like we can just say maximum number of requests and then we just basically stop the health check after that. Um, so, you know, once we've reached like 500 requests, we just stop responding to health checks um, and make sure that we, we get shut down in a, in, a, in a nice way so we can kind of finish the jobs that are running and not take any more and more. I, I don't know, something like that. Uh, yeah, I think I think we can. We've already got an issue. In fact, to um, uh, tackle that, I think it's issue twenty-seven on the um, on the board, which we can move forward once this is done. Um, so, yeah, hopefully, hopefully this will be in sometime next week. Uh, anything else on that before we go to Bob? Cool. Thanks, John. Right. Um, going once, twice, I'll take over. I think I'm just going to share my screen. Uh, so this is um, going to be just, um, let's try to share a single window like Sean does. That work? So um, merge request I've seen like that I opened up yesterday, and it's basically an illustration of the work that we that I've been doing together with Oswaldo uh, yeah, last week. Um, I think it was during the demo last week or two weeks ago. We were discussing the the syntax we were going to use to schedule jobs in bulk stuff like that. So now I'm going through all of the Chrome. Uh, the cron jobs see if they schedule jobs and if necessary create an issue or fix it if it's small enough this was an instance where i thought it was simple enough to deal with myself um so for all cron jobs we've now have them uh, this kind of disabled cop and when you add context to the job we don't need to disable the cop anymore and then things go well and the main thing that you need to do is like always provide a, a project of some kind, since the application context will then fill up everything else that it needs to, the plan, the namespace, all of that stuff. Um, the annoying thing is that we need to uh, make sure that we don't cause extra queries from the sidekick middleware by preloading all the resources. And 
since we include the plan there, we have like different resources that do need to be loaded for FOSS and um, regular GitLab. So that's a little bit annoying, and I only noticed that now, but uh, so we have to have like an EE override of that scope. Which is here. So, so you've got yeah. like you've got lots lots of small changes to lots of different files, basically. Yeah, the, that's going to be it everywhere. Like, um, just add the with context block and add a scope that preloads everything. But in general, the changes are simple enough to like. This is less work than creating an issue and assigning it to the right team to fix it. <laughs> so, yeah. which is a good thing, I think. The good part of the includes is that it doesn't just preload like up front, it just waits for like needing the, the, the resource to then preload, which is nice. Yeah. Um, that's the main thing that I wanted to show. How How about, many, um, like, um, go ahead, Andrew. Go ahead, Joel. Go, go, go ahead. Oh, it's just a quick one. Um, how many other um, cron job queues do we need to fix this for? That was exactly my question. Oh. <laughs> um, so I've got, I've got uh, a bunch of them I already excluded because they uh, don't, don't have any context. context because they don't really yeah, do anything regarding projects or for users or for uh, yeah, anything like that, what's in there. But yeah, you can't see my screen, obviously. I'm showing stuff. And, Mm. So, uh, yeah, admin email, expiring build artifacts, that kind of, yeah, cleanup. I don't know how that works actually. Uh, like these are kind of instance wide tasks. Uh, so, to those, we won't be adding context. And then I'm also paying attention and the uh, where's the issue? Yeah, we, you just like added to just one or two of the, the context. Most most of them just don't, don't handle projects or are very wide. Yeah, the most like the, there's ki kind of two two kind of things. We have ones that schedule a job for each project or whatever those we want to handle, and then we've got a bunch of instance wide things. Um, here there are uh, we make that a little bit like these are the the jobs that currently don't have context this is over the past seven days so that's not a good to the last 24 hours because for example this one should be fixed already and yeah it's gone and um, these ones um as well this one and this one as well fixed by adding them to the runner api that wasn't using context yet so then there's yeah, I'm looking here at the ones that are highest on the list to get rid of those sooner. And how many are there in total? Andrew, do you have an idea on how I can count here? Uh, you want, Without what are you splitting? looking the, yeah, oh, no, you the, want to count, uh, so uh, are you looking for unique counts? Yeah, the unique count of names. Okay, so there's, there's actually, a, you can just go to the metric and expand the metric category uh, -huh. uh yeah and just say unique count and within yeah. unique count there you on it yeah and then say custom label uh name uh i guess it's class yeah. and then you want to stop filtering on you want to stop um splitting your rows on it yeah i just gonna say this that annoys me so much that when you change the aggregation it also clears the field. I don't know if the later versions of Kibana fix this, but like every so, time I'm like, I just want to like mean or median, like, I don't know yet. I'm just exploring and I can keep. Picking. Yeah. <laughs> so I had a call with the Kibana PM a few days ago and I framed it as like, look, like people like me are your company's biggest champion. Like, you know, since 2011, every company I've gone to have got elastic in, like you, you know, you really want to kind of, and uh, I went through like literally hundreds of little niggles exactly like that. And the guy was so, he was just so happy. He was like, you know, because I think they, I think they've kind of lost who the user, like our kind of user is. Um, you know, so I thought that was really, really interesting. And he wants more time. He wants to go through more stuff. So if you have anything particular like that, Sean, I'll pass it on. Cool. Thanks. Um, but yeah, like that. 
it's, it's funny because I, I think it's got quite a good UI in general and then there's just those little things like that where I'm like, damn it, like, I need to actually pick a thing again, the, like the same thing. The, the, the 7 UI that we've just moved across to is truly awful. It but looks really non, polished. It's, it's on it's all React at the moment. And, yeah, and, and on, and on log.gprod. Mm -hmm. I, like I don't understand why they thought that adding animation was a good idea. <laughs> I, and I, that, that was like the main thing I was saying. I was like, look, we use this during incidents. Like everything has to be fast. The keyboard has to work. Like, you, you know, we've got to be able to copy and paste from here to here. And like, um, and then he was like, oh, okay, yeah. That's the number one problem, right? Um, anyway, but, so but that's I, um, yeah. 117 workers that currently don't have context. Um, that seems too high. Three, wait, there's a bunch of the, the ones scheduled, scheduled from the runners. Um, right. So, oh, yeah, because the class is not, it's, it's not been in yet because we just changed it. So I think we have a few old fields that doesn't have the, the context, right? So yeah. they are currently still. Yeah, so the things that were scheduled within 24 hours that don't have context, so before Oswaldo's change was deployed, if it's deployed nice. already, are showing up there. Then we also have the, um, the cron jobs themselves, because the moment they start, yeah. they, don't have cron they don't have context. Uh, and we've got, I don't know how many of those. Um, yeah, so. There's a clean way to, to like clean this for like, making the query work as we expect. This case, for instance. Um, yeah, I also think that maybe we can add caller ID to the Chrome job. But yeah. Um, so yeah, that's what I was doing. The next on the agenda is... Thanks, thanks, Bob. As well, though. Yeah. OK. So we've been, been talking with, about the, the profiling of the on lab kit go the world project for a few a few weeks this this time so yeah I, it's almost in a mergeable state so i think it would be interesting to go through the changes and maybe just explain very quickly uh, a few interesting things that i learned it because i'm not a go developer so i learned it quite a few things so anyway the idea is that uh, just just reminding uh, people, the idea is, is starting the st stack driver profiler that uh, picks uh, profiling, uh, takes the profiling of the the Go process and just sends to an interesting UI in a Go project stack driver profiler. So the idea is just starting the this process when uh, we call the serve method of the monitoring package. So the idea is that we don't really need to change the users of LabKit in order to actually use and start this profiler. The whole thing will be configured by uh, this or Envar. The idea is passing <coughs> GitLab continu continuous profiling with a few params. And also we can just conditionally uh, compile the binary so the idea is that okay if we if we don't want to use the this library with a bunch of dependencies we can just add a build thing here and we pass a tag if we don't pass this this tag continuous profile stack driver we just skip the whole file that has quite a few dependencies like the cloud uh, google.com go profiler and a few other things and we use that here and we use that on the test as well and we need since we use this init profiler function here on the serve uh, the serve function of the, the monitoring package we need to define this this is a, like a new thing we have the new tracer like, like it's a blank state of the of the function it's, it's a function that will not be skipped by this this thing that we added here, the build thing. So we have the new profiler <clears throat> that does nothing. So basically, if you want to skip this function, we'll be doing nothing here. 
So yeah, that, that's basically it. Uh, we have just two like basic functions. One to, to fetch a few params from the, the actual envi env environment. And the other one to just in initialize the profiler. Very basic. Now we are just supporting the stack driver. So if we decide like improving these to, okay, let's use the stack driver or other thing we can iterate on that and improve. Ideally, we, we won't like start two different profilers at once because we are like a little bit concerned about overhead since it's at least the stack driver claims that they, they pick like 5% overhead over the, the go processes. So we need to, to monitor this a little bit to see if that's, that's really what's going to happen. But anyway, that's, that's the, the whole idea of this, this change here. As well, though. So, sorry. Oh, go ahead, Andrew. Okay. My, my first question, and it's not really a question, but it's just something I think we should do. And that is kind of at this point, set expectations about how much bigger the binary will be. So go get workhorse, enter this in, and then build workhorse with the tag off, and then build workhorse with the tag on, and see the size difference. <coughs> and then maybe just like see if there's a difference in like the size of the binary, like the executable when it starts running. I don't think there will be. Um, you know, how much memory it takes. Like, oh, okay. So you mean the and actual size of the binary and the memory consumption, right? Yeah, 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 both of them. Uh, memory, cons memory consumption shouldn't be too hard because um, the way Go compiles, and we've only got one of them, so you can just use like RSS for the memory consumption. It, it should be mm -hmm. good enough. Uh, as a side note, RSS is generally a terrible way of measuring memory usage, um, but but for this this example is fine. The main thing I'd be interested in is how much bigger that binary is because okay. what I think we should do is, so what we did with the tracing was we just enabled um, Jaeger by default in workhorse binary. So like 99.9% .9 of users are never gonna use Jaeger to, to instrument their um, GitLab instance, but we've just stuck it in there anyway. Um, and you know, let's let's take a look at this. The alternative is that we start building our own custom binaries for GitLab.com that have like the build tags that we want in it. But that's obviously got like, because then we can't just use the standard omnibus and that's got like a whole bunch of downside to it. But we could do interesting stuff like we could, like I would very much like to, um, have a Ruby that has distributed tracing points compiled in, and that's a custom um, thing for, for for Ruby. You can say, um, you know, basically compile in, and then you can get a whole lot of extra stuff out of out of Ruby just using um, the the trace points that they compile in. Mm -hmm. But you know, in general, like that's going to be a whole lot of work. Like that would be a big piece of work to get custom builds of of GitLab. So I don't think that's going to be necessary, but knowing how much bigger we're making the binary is, 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 is worth putting into that discussion. Yeah, yeah. I'll update the, the description of the merge quest, this information. Oh, you really cool. well. thanks, thanks, thanks for the, the help there on this merge quest as well, Andrew. Cool, man, my pleasure. I'm really excited about this. So uh, who's next? I think it's probably me. This is kind of like yeah, not a super exciting thing, but it's kind of super exciting to me. But oh, sorry. Uh, I think Sean oh, yeah. wanted to ask something. Do you still want to ask? Oh, yeah, no, that was actually answered. I was going to ask about like whether we wanted to like remove the build tag and just have it like on by default. That kind of got answered anyway. Oh, okay. So. Mm -hmm. yeah. So what we've done, Sean, what we've done with Jaeger is that we've, when Omnibus builds Workhorse and Giddily, it, it has the build tag for Jaeger enabled. Um, you know, so it's kind of one of the default build tags. So we, we could switch it around and make it that the default is that it builds it. But yeah, it's, it's following the same convention that we've got for the other conditional stuff um, for now. Um, cool, I will share my screen quick. Um, 
Right. So uh, this isn't super exciting, but um, I think it's going to have like a lot of benefits in some places. Uh, and so yesterday I saw a whole bunch of like of the old alerts kind of from before we had service level monitoring and they were saying things like this Gilly server has had 20 errors in the last like um, one minute or last five minutes. And the, the thing is that like 20 errors, it could be that the client's gone away, it could be a client side error. And so those alerts that we, we get for the Gilly nodes are kind of like the really old school alerts before we started focusing on, on the SLIs and everything like that. And, and, they, and they're also a, an absolute value, not a rate. So 20 errors out of 10,000 messages probably isn't something you want to wake a, an operator up about, but you know, 20 out of 40 is, is really high. And so I really wanted to get rid of the alert, but I realized that we can't really do that until we are monitoring each individual Gidley node because there are now like 50 Gidley nodes. And so one of them can be pretty much failing everything and taking too long on the uptake scores. But in general, the, the service, the Gidley service will be fine because one out of 50 is, is too small to actually dent the headline figure. And because that one out of 50 will impact the users who are experiencing a, a bad time on that server, like we need to have node level monitoring. Um, and so what this change is about is, uh, let me just go down here, is adding to the metrics catalog, let me just find, so, so we, you know, we've got this, this metrics catalog and this says that um, for this service, uh, for the Gidley service, you know, it's got two components. It's got one component called Go Server, and it's got another component called Gilly Ruby. And like for the Go Server, we measure the latency using this histogram. Um, and you know, anything that takes less than half a second gets a hundred percent score for Aptex. Anything that takes uh, more than a second gets a fifty percent score. Anything that takes longer than a second. Um, Sorry, anything that takes, yeah, is, is basically gets zero. And so that's how we measure the uptake score for the Go service component. And this is how we count how many requests are going through. And then this is how we do the error rate for this, for this component. And Bob did some work on this yesterday. So now, by enabling this node level monitoring, it basically automatically generates a new set of aggregations. So we always aggregate these up to the service level. So, so basically, we know that for the Gidley service, on average, the Aptex score across all uh, 50 servers is like 99.5%. And if it goes below 99%, or actually if it goes below 95%, um, we will get an alert. And we should actually push this up because this was pushed down quite heavily during the, um, the troubles in November and December. And this is actually very low for Gidley now. We should push it back up, but um, that's kind of out of scope. And so what this does is by adding this node level monitoring, it adds a whole bunch of new recording rules that will basically aggregate to the level of a, um, of a server. And so this is an auto-generated file. So this gets auto-generated key metrics. It gets generated automatically. Um, well, not automatically. You've got, to, you've got to check it in for the moment. Um, and so instead of just... Uh, aggregating up to the Gidley level, it's also telling us what shard it is and then what the fully qualified domain name is. And so what this will give us is that if file 02 is performing really, really badly, we will measure it along the same, um, the same way as we measure the entire service, but, but just for that node, we can say file 02 is not, measure, it was, is not meeting its SLO demands and we'll get a, uh, an alert for that, for that individual server. Um, and so anything that is kind of like a single point of failure in our, in our setup, um, we should basically enable node level metrics. I don't how think did you there's specify many which, others. Sorry, how did you specify there which labels uh, define a node? Because I saw there the sum added the fully qualified domain name and the shard, but shard yeah. is a Gitterly specific thing, right? 
No, Shard is, Shard is actually now one of the, of the top level things. So most have just got Shard equals main, but the, the, the idea of Shard is that the, um, the things in a Shard are running all, all, the, all the different deployments in a Shard, all the different instances in a Shard are running the same version of the code, right? Where Canary is running a, a forward version, so it's different. A shard is like like an isolation bulkhead. Um, so you know, like the marquee customers are shard. Um, the th but those things. Shard um, is not the thing that we call a shard when we talk about. No, it's a yeah, it's a it's a, and we like we've got it in several places. We're using it for different like it's it's a fairly arbitrary dimension. But the important thing is that it's running the same version of the code. You know, it's not it's not like a different um, deployment, which is what we get with stage. Um, so, but but it is a good question, Bob, because the way that we do that is we've got this thing that renders this file, and at the moment that's just hard coded in there. So, but because it's a general label that we have on all of our um, so shard is on all of our nodes, so we can just. Yeah, so we can just say here, we can say node level aggregation labels. So then all we do is we say, if this has got node level metrics enabled, we just add, uh, you know, we just aggregate over this. The, there is a question now, like as we transition over to Kubernetes and pods, like, like at the moment, all the stuff we're doing is very much um, cattle. And so, you know, we're probably not going to be doing node level monitoring on it. But like in some future world, maybe we have like, you know, these pets that are running in Kubernetes, like maybe a Giddly deploy. And in that case, FQDN wouldn't work because the, the Kubernetes deploy, you know, the sidekick instances don't have a FQDN. They've got a pod or pod name, um, but they don't have a FQDN. And so maybe we want to kind of roll it up. But the thing that's great is that it's all just generated now, right? So as long as it's got that tag on it, you know, we can change it and, and all the code will change. And if we say, you know, if, if a Giddly server returns a certain, like a yeah. certain If we code, define what node means, then... Yeah, exactly. And, and also when we change something at a service level, like to say, you know, if, if uh, you know, we, we can ignore all the errors from this thing, um, you know, from this method, for example, because it's a really noisy method. That will apply at the service level and at this level, where at the moment there's like two different rule sets that we're using for alerting on the node level and the service level. So it's kind of just bringing everything in line. So I'm pretty happy about that. And that is not much of a demo, but um, that's what I've been working on today. I'm very happy about that. Cool. Uh, Do you have, um, just to show us the, the Two queries, like one service level, one open somewhere in one of your million tabs, yeah. perhaps. Uh, yeah, I can. Well, I can just. I. I uh, let me let me share my screen again. Oh, I just shared my desktop, but that's okay. Um, so, if we go take a look at. Uh, so this is one for, what is this? This is Gilly Ruby. Uh, let's go take a look at the Go server because generally that's more interesting. So this is an AppDeck score for the Go server. And you can see it's pretty complex now, but like what's nice is that it's like there's a single source of truth for that rather than trying to maintain like 20 different copies. Yeah, this um, query is just the artifact of something that's a bit more descriptive. Yeah, yeah, exactly. This is a... Um, and then if we just open up this form file, we'll go and find the Go server um, GitLab components updates. Looks like a new. Struggling. I'm not so happy with me doing that. I mean, it's probably easiest just to take this, 
So, so one of the things that's really interesting about this is that there is this one server that's doing really, really badly. And when this rolls in, when the alert rolls in, at least we'll have to put a silence on this. But I do think it's worth investigating why Prefecto 2, not Prefecto 1, just Prefecto 2, only gets its, uh, you know, it only makes it like 50% of the time. Um, so I we should investigate the same what that thing is. When I was, because that one has much more um, limited deadlines as well. Does it? Yeah I, yeah, I think I linked a comment to you somewhere at some point. Yeah. Yeah, it's, 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 it's this, there's definitely something. And also like the, the other thing to keep in mind is that this is pulling down the entire services um, metrics, right? So we should understand why it's doing this. Um, yeah. And so, you know, obviously the other way that this is done is you just simply take off um, these things. The other reason why I'm quite happy with this um, is that, so the recording rules that we use on gitlab.com, so you know, we're all about dog feeding, and the recording rules that we use to monitor gitlab.com, we can't take and put into the product because the product doesn't have the same labels. So you know, if, you, if you give GitLab to a, a customer and the customer is running things, if they try to aggregate by environment stage, tier, type, you know, they've just got like a GitLab instance. And so, because previously we used to hand roll all of these queries for the recording rules, it wasn't possible for us to just generate these and, and like actually put them into the product. Um, and this is like the first time that I've used it to kind of generate a whole different set of recording rules with different labels, you know, aggregating in a different way. And it kind of proves to me that at some stage we'll be able to take this and generate like recording rules that we can, that we can hand over to like product teams or engineering teams and say like, this is how we found is the best, best way to monitor a GitLab instance. This is the way you should be doing it rather than, you know, like I see some of the rules that we ship with the product, they're not fantastic. Like we certainly couldn't use them, that'd be super noisy. Um, and so it's kind of like a bit of a, it's proof that the reverse dog fooding effort of like taking what we're doing and pushing back to the product is viable, um, I think. Um, so, sorry, I was, I was kind of in the middle of that. So here, this is what it would look like aggregated up to the um, up to the service. Uh, just a shout out about the new React UI. All very everyone's very excited about this. So give that a try if you want to see the future of Prometheus. It's like basically one for one at the moment, but it's gonna get there. Um, now I've lost my query. Um, yeah. And so, like, I can't think of any other services where we need this, but we definitely need it for Gidley. Um, so it, it's pretty useful there. And that's, anyone else got any questions? Here we go. So it's kind of interesting, the canary stages are so really not great at the moment. But that's mostly because the traffic volumes are just very, very low. Right, I saw you also, this is unrelated, I saw you also change the alerting for Canary, right, Andrew? Uh, yeah, so Canary won't alert on, so before it was like if any service stage combination goes below SLO, we'll alert on it. And now we, we only alert on Canary if Canary's firing, uh, is Canary breaking the threshold and, and production isn't. So that's the kind of bad Canary alert. And then only we only do that if that stage is receiving more than one percent of the traffic of production to kind of because there's been quite a lot of those bad canary alerts and it's just chopping down those. It also means that when there is like you know so the Postgres goes, we'll get the alert for main stage, but we won't get a duplicate alert for the canary stage. And so that's. Uh, <laughs> 
sorry about the break in recording there. I hit a keyboard shortcut okay. in the wrong program that stops the recording, apparently. <laughs> so, um, yes, no, that makes sense, Andrew. Thanks for explaining that. Sorry, that's completely unrelated. Um, we've got to really limit the time on the discussion items because we've got under 10 minutes left. Um, Oswaldo, or do we move them to Monday? Because uh, well, yeah, these are these are discussion items. Like Oswaldo or Bob, do you think we can cover either of these in the nine minutes that are left? Uh, my point is about the the idea in potency, like just a discussion about like a summary of what the plan could be to improve a little bit uh, the idea potency and the tests that we are planning to do on sidekick jobs. I think we can discuss a little bit uh, async on, on the issue itself. Um, it's just a, a list of things and ideas that we can do. So if you want to discuss quickly this one. Would it be really terrible if we added like um, a middleware to fire multiple jobs on develop in GDK? So let's do so that in people, test. Let's do that in tests, like <laughs> figure out a way how we can do it for all workers in tests already. But yeah, every worker is called differently. It would be yeah. interesting yeah. to add that in GitLab QA um, because that will be running things that use background jobs in a, in a better way than the tests test it and also in a more systematic way than people develop. Yeah. Um, I think it's going to be hard. <laughs> yeah. If we to get do to that this now, then, then there's no, there, we won't see a QA pass for a while, I think. Right, that's what I mean. Like, I think it's going to be hard to get to this point, especially because some of the jobs are things like, um, you know, send an email. So we have to build a whole bunch of extra tracking around, like, well, we've already sent this specific email, so we need to not send this specific email again, but we might need to send an identical email, like, two minutes later. Um, so it's going to take a while, yeah. but uh, yeah, thanks as well. Though let's um, maybe add that to the Monday call, um, and we can hopefully spend a bit. Longer. Yeah, we can discuss in a little bit better there. Mm -hmm. Okay. So there's one last point from Bob. Do you want yeah. to? Um, this one? It's just like storage came up twice already, and storage use on psychic nodes. And I was just kind of brainstorming on how important this is to uh, add this as a resource boundary, if it is. Um, and I don't really know how storage on psychic nodes is currently used, which was a bit surprising. So yeah, I just wanted to bring it up, uh, see if there's thoughts on that. Like, I mean, this, I, is, this is a thing that I think is kind of, fun like you know i certainly enjoyed sort of reading through camel's mr and like you know then the issue and i was like oh we could do this like maybe there's other things we could do but i also wonder if it's a little bit of a trap because we don't have that many workers that need that much storage at the moment yeah. and maybe we could just tackle them one by one for now that's kind of like the, i do feel a bit of that as well like there's we know what the, we know who the troublemakers are right um and and you know who the troublemakers are now and it's the yeah import and export yeah uh, and they're already running on their own set of nodes <laughs> specifically for that and we know that duke is going to add one and we all, we've already told him like yeah just just let us know <laughs> so we can <laughs> probably deal with that just by yeah, yeah i think i, I think this it. is i think this is fun to keep in the back of our minds but maybe not high priority yeah. particularly yeah it's yeah, like sort of bang for buck, it could be, it depends on how long it would kind of take to, to add that attribute. It's probably not like a huge amount. The attribute effort, itself, but, not long, but yeah, um, yeah. then discussing what the margins should be and then keeping yeah. an eye on what... Yeah, because, exactly, yeah. Like we, right now we have no idea um, which jobs are using a lot of storage until we get an alert that a node is running out of storage and then we see which queues are there and then we know aha yeah. it's you yeah. <laughs> yeah cool okay i'm gonna wrap this up because we've got five minutes until the yeah. um kubernetes migration call so thanks very much everybody and um speak to you all soon bye